The minimalists want to help you avoid impulse purchases. That's why we created five questions to ask before buying, which is now a wallpaper for your smartphone. Now you'll always have a reminder when you're getting ready to purchase something new. Head on over to theminimalists.com slash before to download your free wallpaper today. The Minimalists. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And my name is Ryan Nicodemus, and together we are the Minimalists. What does your best life look like? Not your Instagram life, your real life. That's what we're going to discuss today. It's just me and Ryan in the studio. I'm excited, man. It's been a while. Just the two of us. Just the two of us. We were going to have Timothy J. Ward on today, but he ended up in the hospital last night. Yeah, buddy. We hope uh, we hope you're feeling better if you're listening to this. He has a great YouTube channel. We'll put a link to Timothy in the show notes. He talks about minimalism, becoming a minimalist, what led him down that path. Yeah. I really like his Twitter bio. It says, my goal in life is to have very little and want even less. That's Yeah, that's great, man. His videos are awesome, man. It's... uh. They're inspiring, dude. He, yeah. He's, he's a great example of, um, I don't know, just uh, someone who really got clear on what he wanted out of life, what his values were, what his priorities were, and he went after it. And now, I don't want to live Timothy's life personally. No. But it, it is inspiration to, to have, uh, I don't know, like I, I just, it's kind of like Colin Wright, mm-hmm. you know? It's like when I first saw him, I'm like, oh, if minimalism is owning only 50 things then i don't want to do that but then i actually saw what he was using minimalism for right and then it all made sense i was like oh i could use this for my life in a certain way but yeah he's got a great recipe that you can totally tweak some ingredients out well he's they're both using it colin timothy and most minimalists i know are using it to live their best life not the best life as though there is a template but they've sort of created their own recipe for that so let's start by diving into these questions the first one today is from jerry in new jersey hi my name is jerry waters from south jersey my question is after you guys you know went through the whole transition of becoming minimalist you know you took certain things out your life um how how were those around you accepting of it were they accepting of it you know how did they how do they view it? Did they think that you guys were weird? Did you think you guys were like going through something serious? But yeah, I just wanted to know how you guys dealt with the people around you and how they came to accept it. Josh, isn't it funny, man? When when you make a major change in your life, mm-hmm. I know this happens when you make a major change. I don't, so I'm gonna ask you if this happens to you when I make a major change or anyone else that you know you're friends with or respect or look up to. I know how much you look up to me. <laughs> but when someone makes a change. There's this instant there's this instant thing that happens where you feel like you have to either accept or reject that person's change. Mm-hmm. And if you accept it, or if I, so speaking in for myself, if I accept it, there's this mechanism in my brain that's like, "Oh, well, now I need to make a change." Right. I need to follow that same path. Right. If I reject it, mm-hmm. then that makes me feel like, "Oh, I don't need to make any changes. I'm on the right path. This person is crazy." And then I will, you know, project that. I, I don't do that so much anymore because there is a third path, which most people don't take, I feel. Okay. Which is just accepting the differences and being able to move on and support that person even with their differences. I feel like my... That, 20- that seems to be the harder path to take oh, yeah. too, right? Absolutely. And, and because, like, like you said, we, we have this knee-jerk reaction. I'll even take it a step further for, for you, Ryan is I think sometimes the measurement of how much we love someone is actually how much we're willing to support them mm-hmm. in that change yeah. or in their new success. Or yeah, or how much we're willing to support the, their differences that we have. Well, I'm, th- I'm just thinking about back in, like when we were in the corporate world, for example, if I saw someone have some sort of wild success, like they, were, they won President's Club and I didn't, well, I, it was hard for me to celebrate that person yeah and and now it's it's easy like if if you have a win ryan or if podcast sean has a win or jordan no more or 
uh, social jest, anyone on our team has a win, then I, I feel like I'm winning by proxy. Yeah. Whereas before, if someone achieved something I didn't achieve, here's a really good example. Our, our good friend, Matt Diavella, who's uh, directed our first film. We're working on our second film with him right now. It's called Less Is Now. Mm -hmm. It'll be out on Netflix next year. And um, his YouTube channel has really taken off. Now, oh, we, yeah. We don't focus on YouTube. Really. I mean, we put our podcast up on YouTube, but it has not been a main focus for us. Our podcast and our writing tend to be our, our main focus. And Matt has just taken off millions of subscribers. Mm -hmm. And I think my old self would have been like, Oh, what, why aren't I doing that? Yeah, like, wh what or, are we doing wrong? What am I doing? Or, or I can't believe he's so successful. Why? And yeah. now it's like, wow, Like I feel like I'm winning because Matt Diavella is winning. Yeah. And it takes a, a certain level of, of maturity to get there. Mm -hmm. But I think ultimately what Jerry is asking is how do you help encourage others to have that level of support, maturity, and, and ultimately love? Yeah. No, that's a great question, man. Uh because yes, Jerry, when I first started down this path, people thought I was weird. They thought I was strange. Um, when Josh started down this path, I remember, you know, my boss asking me, uh, is Josh, uh, is he depressed? Is he thinking about killing himself? Because he was giving away his things. Mm -hmm. So yes, people absolutely judged and they projected that judgment. I have been guilty of judging and projecting my judgment. So I, I think that, Knowing that it helps me to get through it a little bit more to kind of understand like people are imperfect and instead of me getting defensive, uh, I can just kind of look at someone and say, you know what, I understand that this is a bit uh, uh, subversive or maybe, uh, you know, this creates a visceral feeling in someone. So they're reacting based on this emotion that is happening, but I don't have to, I don't have to react to that emotion, but here's ultimately why I didn't let those people affect me too much. It, some of it hurt, like, don't get me wrong. Um, but ultimately the people who were judging me, mm. like I didn't want to live their life. Right. So like, why would I, why would I get down on myself and, and perpetuate that, that hurt? Cause again, like some of it did hurt, but I didn't perpetuate it because I looked at the people doing the judging and I'm like, I don't emulate these people anyway. Yeah, or I don't want to. Yeah. And if I am emulating them, I want to move away from that emulation. Mm -hmm. I, I will add one. There's a hidden secret here, Ryan, hmm. and it is hiding in plain sight. And that's because we are so wrapped up in our own identities, in our own head, and what we think people think about us. Most people, when I became a minimalist, most people didn't notice. Right. And the ones who did notice didn't really care. Yeah. No one really cares that you're simplifying your life. And if they really care about you, then they care about the changes you're making for the good. If they are judging you, maybe they feel like uh, that, that, that they're being judged themselves. But I, I can tell you this, if you don't go around announcing the wild changes that you're making, yeah. no one's even gonna notice anyway. Yeah, it's like you can be a minimalist, you can be a vegan, you can do CrossFit, you could do whatever. It, it's okay as long as you're not projecting judgment onto others. Uh -huh. As long as, you know, Jerry, if you're taking this path for yourself and you are supporting other people and showing other people respect and not judging other people, then that's probably going to be mirrored back into your life. Now, if it's if there are some people who do the judging, again, um, you've got to ask yourself, like, do you really want to live that person's life who's doing the judging? And if not, and I, then, I think that's what he's worried about. Yeah. He, he's, he's probably worried about, well, all these people are going to judge me for the changes that I make. Good. If you actually do have some people, now it doesn't mean you have to go out and proselytize. You don't have to right. go out and say, here's what I'm doing. You need to do this as well. In fact, I remember being several months into my whole minimalist journey. I talked to Ryan about I'm a minimalist. And Ryan's like, you're not a minimalist. Like, <laughs> like, because he had a particular sort of, um, idea in his mind about what that word meant mm -hmm. and and I never went around and saying look at me you need to become a minimalist too you don't have to go around and proselytize but good if there are some people who are like hey that's stupid or that's dumb I can't believe you're doing this I can't believe you're changing your life 
oh, well, you just told me that I no longer need to spend my most precious resources on you, my time, my energy, yeah. my attention, my skills, my love, my caring. I would rather take those and provide those those resources to people who who will benefit from them. Yeah. I'll tell you what, Jerry, I'm gonna send you a copy of our book, Minimalism, Live a Meaningful Life. There's a relationships chapter in there. It's a book about the five foundational values in our life. And right now you're talking about the people in your life. You'll often hear me say you can't change the people around you, but you can change the people around you. And that's really what that chapter is about. If you enjoy our podcast, you'll like the audiobook version of Minimalism, Live a Meaningful Life. It's our first book. Uh, or we'll send you the book book or the ebook if you'd like those as well. Our next question is from Justin in Denver. Hi, this is Justin in Washington Park, Denver. I've heard it said that if your plan isn't working, you may have to change your blueprint. My question is, is changing your blueprint giving up on what you want out of life? So is changing your blueprint giving up on what you want out of life? Mm. Um, no. It is giving up on what you wanted out of life. Mm. In fact, it's necessary to change your blueprint in order to grow, in order to live what you might perceive as your best life. And let me give you a few examples here. My daughter's six years old. If she continues to have the same blueprint when she's 16 years old, she's going to live a discontented life. Yeah. And the same is true when she's 26 or 36. And so... I think it necessarily has to change because what we want out of life necessarily changes. And even for me, in a more narrow scope, I embraced minimalism a decade ago when I was 28 years old. My life is several times different now from what it was then. The fundamentals are similar, the same values, similar beliefs, similar interests, but the circumstances have certainly changed. I live in a different place. Mm -hmm. I uh, have a spouse and a kid. I have different friends and family. We have a different business from where we were. We were in the corporate world. Yeah. We have several businesses. I teach a writing class online. And so all of my circumstances change and necessarily my blueprint has to change. Otherwise, I'm going to be stifled. Yeah, no, I totally agree, man. I, I think when it comes to your wants and your blueprint, you do not necessarily have to change your wants, not necessarily. Um, the question is, is whether or not those wants, those desires, if that aligns with your values, if that aligns with living a meaningful life. So what I mean by that is like, when I think about money, for example, mm -hmm. I just wanted money. I thought money was gonna solve all my problems. And didn't even know why, right? Right, and that, that was a problem uh -huh. because money didn't accentuate my values. It didn't accentuate my beliefs it just solved my money problems, which, which felt really big at the time. And I think that with the money thing, you didn't know why, but you knew the, you knew the what, right? Mm -hmm. You didn't even know the how. Money's gonna make me happy. And, and the what was like, I will buy this. What are you going to buy with the money? I'll buy a car, I'll buy a house, I will, I, I will do these things. That's the what. Right. How will you be happy? I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's like that underpants thing. What was that from South Park? Where it was like... Uh, Steel underpants. Yeah. Then Step two, question mark. Step three, profit. Right. And yeah, uh, it's, it's for, a good example. For you, it was like... And me too. It was like, yeah. make money. Step two. Mm -hmm. yeah. Step three, happiness. Yeah. No, man, it's, it's, it's true. It's like I... I th well, first off, I thought a million bucks, like having a million bucks in my bank account, like that is what was going to make me happy because then I'd be able to focus on... Uh, you know, my real priorities. And what I have found out is that you can live a really good life for way less than a million bucks. Mm -hmm. um, but when you, you know, when I got to the point where I was earning, you know, well into six figures a year in Ohio, which is like, I mean, that's, you know, you're basically a millionaire if you're, <laughs> if you're making over six figures in Dayton, Ohio. I solved all my money problems, but then all that happened is that I started to see all of the other problems I had in my life. Mm-hmm. And a lot of those problems couldn't be fixed with money. My health, my relationships. And sometimes they're made worse with money. Yeah. If you my, don't have the right habits in place. Yeah, exactly, man. There's a, I've been watching this show called The Politician on Netflix. Uh -huh. And it's uh, it's about this kid who's running for high school, his class president in high school. Yeah. And um, it's just, it's a great show. But there's this line in there where this girl talks about how 
the problem with being rich is the the money makes the hard things easy, mm-hmm. which then in turn make the easy things seem hard. So, so true. So when I got to a point in my life where I was like making the money I wanted to make, I was frustrated because I'm like, why do I have all these other problems? Like I have solved all the hard problems. Mm-hmm. So it, it just accentuated all the smaller problems. So Justin, if you're chasing things that don't align with your values, uh, then yes, you need to give those wants up. Right. And, but, and by the way, you can give them up temporarily too, right? Yeah. So Ryan and I, we have this this rule where we talk about essentials, non-essentials, and junk. Another way to look at that is need, want, like. There are some things in our life that we absolutely need. And I think they're pretty similar for most of us. Mm-hmm. There are other things that we don't necessarily need, but we want because they add value to our lives. Yeah. There are other things, however, that are junk. And most of us myself included, we justify the junk by thinking, pretending that it adds value to our lives. It's so true, man. When I think about, too, my past life, there there were these once that I had, you know, mainly chasing money. Uh huh. I thought that if I was able to fulfill that piece of it, then it would bring me enough contentment to ignore what was going on. Oof. So, like, Right now, I think about, you know, I always talk about buying a Tesla. Mm -hmm. They're slick. They got the self, you know, the autopilot. They're eco-friendly. I mean, there's just a long list of reasons that I could totally buy a Tesla and feel good about it. But ultimately, I don't want to spend that, you know, 50 grand Mm -hmm. or whatever it is to, to buy a Tesla. And I'm at a point in my life now where I can, you know, objectively look at it and say, I'm happy now. Yeah. I'm totally content now. Buying a Tesla is not going to make me any happier. I'm no. just going to stop wanting a Tesla. And I think that's one of the things we, we often confuse. I'll, I'll try to break this down real quick. I'm writing about this in our new book, Love People Use Things, which will be out in 2021. But um, we confuse pleasure. You would get some pleasure from buying the Tesla, especially immediately. And, sure. and throughout, I think it would, it would increase, marginally increase your pleasure, right? Mm-hmm. And we confuse pleasure for happiness. Then we confuse happiness for contentment. And then we confuse contentment for joy. Mm-hmm. And, and these are just different layers of the, the sort of satisfaction continuum here, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, we'll try to, actually on the maximum episode, I'll try to go a little bit deeper on, on the difference between those things. I have one final analogy here for Justin. And because it's not that you want to get rid of your desires necessarily. Sure. We're, we're going to have Pete Rollins uh, back on the podcast to talk about desire mm-hmm. and, and this, this concept of uh, object A and the Tesla for you is the object A. Mm-hmm. But um, we want our problems to get better. And sometimes what money does is it does help us in, in, in a way, weird way and it's uncomfortable. It illuminates some of those other problems mm-hmm. that you had where you thought you were going to cover up the problems with money, right. paper, paper mache over them with $100 bills. Yeah, like being rich is going to make me feel so good that I'm going to feel less bad about the, these other areas of my life. No, but if you fix one, one area of problems if it's a money problem for example because now you're on a budget you've paid off debt you've worked really hard you've earned more income whatever it might be and now all of a sudden you start to fix those money problems what comes to the forefront whatever other problems you have relationship problems clutter problems problems with the truth in your life problems with living a a discontented life that doesn't align with the person you want to become Uh, maybe you have other problems uh, love life problems or or maybe you have creative problems problems with distractions these are all problems that start to come to the forefront that are by definition, preventing you from living your best life. However, these are better problems to have. Mm-hmm. And what that really means, and to get to the core of Justin's questions here, are you giving up on your dreams? Uh, well, well, no. You're changing your plan because your wants have to necessarily change over time. It's just like playing a video game. Mm. 
if you play Super Mario Brothers, but you're always just playing the first level over and over and over, it doesn't get any more difficult because you've mastered that problem, the problems of that. And you can get really, really good at, at going through that level faster and faster and faster, but it becomes boring. It becomes monotonous. Mm -hmm. It becomes not worth even playing the game. Yeah. And so what I would say is if your blueprint doesn't change over time, those same things are going to happen to you. You want additional challenge. You don't want a problem-free life. Mm. Uh, you don't want a life that is no anxiety, no stress. You want the appropriate amount that allows you to grow. Mm. That area of discomfort, the discomfort zone, is the place from which we grow the most. Yeah. Justin, I'd love to send you a copy of our book, Everything That Remains. It's my favorite thing that Ryan and I have ever created. And it's really about the five-year journey of letting go for us, it's a story of giving up our old dreams, changing our, as our once changed, we also changed our dreams along the way. My dream once upon a time was to be a C-level executive. I want to be the COO of this corporation. That's not a dream to me anymore. That's a nightmare. Mm. And so sometimes our dreams turn into nightmares on a long enough timeline. And so everything that remains is the story of Ryan and I leaving behind those old dreams, those that template the society provided for us, moving forward, creating our own dreams and living more meaningfully along the way. We either send you the audio book or the book book or the ebook version if you'd like, Justin. Ryan, what time is it? You know what time it is. It is time for our lightning round where we answer questions from social media. Indeed we do. We are at the minimalists on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. You can, uh, you can find us over there. You can ask us your questions. Now, what we do during the lightning round is we, we try to answer your questions with just a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. We put the text to these minimal maxims in the show notes so you can copy and share our pithy answers on social media if you like. And now you can find all of our minimal, minimal maxims in one place over at minimalmaxims.com. All right, Stephen wants to know, how do you deal with the stress of a society that's telling you what your best life should be? Mm. Well, here's something pithy for you, Stephen. If you follow someone else's recipe, you will bake the same cake, but you might not enjoy the taste. So true. You know, here's the thing. Someone else tells you, here's my recipe. I like that. I like looking at people's recipes. Mm -hmm. We were talking about this very at the very opening. I don't want to follow Timothy J. Ward's recipe. I don't want to follow... Uh, Colin Wright's recipe or Joshua Becker's recipe or, or God, Leo Babalta's recipe. I don't want six kids. <laughs> I don't, but I can look at their overall recipe and say, oh, wow, I like the taste of that ingredient. It's just like when you look at a bunch of different uh, recipes, you might see a really great recipe, but you're like, I hate onions and garlic. I don't, I'm not going to put onions and garlic. I like everything else about that stew that you're making. My, my version, not going to have onions and garlic. Mm. It's different from a template. A template is ready-made. I have to follow it piece by piece, instruction by instruction. It's Ikea provides templates for their furniture. Yeah. And if you don't follow that template, I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna do half of this. You're probably not gonna have something that is functional. Right. With a recipe, however, you're able to adjust it for taste. And so yeah. Stephen, how do you deal with the stress of a society that's telling you what your best life should be? Don't worry about their best life. Worry about your best life. Amen. I got a couple of pithy answers here for you, Stephen. You'll never live your best life living for others' expectations. So the only expectations you need to worry about are your own. Now, that doesn't mean to be selfish. It doesn't mean to ignore the people around you. But what that means is that you do have to put that oxygen mask on yourself first before you can actually truly give 100%. If you're just living for other people's expectations, well, then you're you're always going to feel like you're just barely getting above water. You're going to feel like you're drowning in other people's expectations. Uh, the second pithy answer I have is the best life is a meaningful life. So, Stephen, what is your recipe for a meaningful life? Like, that's what you got to look at, man. Um, there's one thing I do want to – caveat I want to throw in here about the best life in Western culture, there is this like very, um, there's a societal pressure to love, laugh, live, mm -hmm. dance like no one is watching. Yeah. I mean, it, it is, it's very cliche to like, you know, live your best life. But here's the thing. Mm -hmm. You're never going to live a 100% best life. 
It's it's like trying to find a relationship that is 100% perfect. Does it exist? Uh, sure. I'm sure there are, you know, people out there who have the best relationship in the best life 100%, but it's not the expectation to live a a best life, which is a perfect life. Mm. It's not really a fair expectation to put on yourself. Right. I, I think I think I would just delineate the two. I, I think a best life is the best version of your life, and that's never going to be perfect. Right. And so maybe there's a few other minimal maxims here. There's something like a simple life is the best life, mm-hmm. but also the best life is not a perfect life. Mm. Yeah, that's good. And, and because... It, what we're really talking about are standards versus expectations here, right? Yeah. You, if you expect everything to to be perfect, I got into a car accident last week. Someone rear-ended me, and mm. and I'm I remember walking away from that just hugging Bex because she was in the passenger seat. I was seated at a red light back in Dayton, Ohio, and um, working on this this film project, Less Is Now, that we're working on, and I'm just sitting there in line la- and at, at the red light in a rental car, very soft music playing. It's uh, William Fitzsimmons. You know mm-hmm. how soft and sleepy his music is. It's my last night in Ohio, and I'm just sitting there and vibing out, and all of a sudden, BAM! Out of nowhere. Like, my my head snaps back, total whiplash, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And, uh, but I walked away from it just with with extreme gratitude, even though I was in pain, my back really hurt, my neck hurt, mm-hmm. a huge inconvenience, and I'm gonna have to deal with all. But Sam Harris has this really great thought experiment that I absolutely love. Hmm. Um, it, we we have all these problems right now, right? We're, we're, you're always gonna have problems, yeah. right? But there are always gonna be problems that are much worse than that, right? Mm-hmm. And so let's say, what's the worst thing that could have happened? And I maybe I could have been paralyzed. Yeah. In, in that car accident, yeah. right? I could have, uh, Bex could have died. Yeah. Um, how much money would I pay to reverse that? Right. I mean, the paralyzation. Uh, you can't put a price on it, really. Right, right. It's priceless, At yeah. All of it. How much would I pay? Anything that I could pay for the rest of my life to not be paralyzed. All of a sudden, mm-hmm. that provides me with a m- much different perspective and realizing that many of my problems aren't real problems. Mm-hmm. They're challenges that are actually ma- that make my life interesting that add variety to my life in a way that um that if i were just you know, seated at a mountaintop for the rest of my life yeah meditating i i wouldn't have that same level of variety or or fulfillment i don't think this makes me think of another thing from the politician it really is like a, it's kind of an inspiring show but uh there's this part where this mother is explaining to her son like honey life and i'll keep this clean because uh so far we haven't cussed on the on the show and i always like drop something and then it ruins the whole show for being a clean episode like ella likes hearing herself at the beginning of the episode yeah so it, it's uh she says honey life is a poop tornado and it's got little bits of gold in it mm-hmm. and what you have to do is figure out how to grab those bits of gold as you know as much as you can and the reason why she's explaining this because her son is explaining how life is a it's like a train you got your track and you know, now now I've been derailed, and she's like, no, 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 no. Like life is a torn is a is a poop tornado mm-hmm. with little bits of gold in it. And you have to grab the gold. But it got me thinking that the best life, man, it's learning how to be covered in poop and be content with that. Oh, ooh, that's good. So so maybe there's even a step farther, right? Hmm. Sometimes poop saves people's lives. Fecal fecal microbiota <laughs> yeah, that's transplants. Right. That's true. Yeah, yeah. And, and so in <laughs> one scenario, like I don't want to eat a poop sandwich. Right. I think that tastes like crap. <laughs> but uh, if I need to, maybe if I had C. diff, for example, which I've actually had in the past, people are using fecal microbiota transplants now yeah. to literally cure C. diff, which kills, what, 29,000 people a year in the United States? I mean, it's a pretty big deal. And so sometimes the thing that we're grossed out by or that we think is awful is also the thing that saves our lives. Yeah, I like that, man. All right, we've got a bunch more to get to before our added value segment and our listener tips today. Looks like we have a bunch more surprise questions this week. Is there ever a point where your best life and your Instagram life are in alignment? (laughs) Oh, How do you determine what your what your 
best life is? How do I ensure I choose a partner that fits into my best life? Man, one of the most important decisions that you're ever going to make in your mm -hmm. life. We'll talk about that. How can I find a larger sense of purpose in my life? Is happiness the best goal in life? If not, what is? Who has made you laugh the most in your life? And it looks like we've got about 7 billion more questions here about minimalism today. And if you want to hear all that, you can listen to this week's Maximal episode available exclusively on Patreon. That's right. You're currently listening to our weekly Minimal episode. But each week, Ryan and I record an entirely different, much longer Maximal episode on the Minimalist Private Podcast, which gives us the private space we need to talk about topics we don't usually discuss in public. Plus, Patreon is the best way for us to fund this podcast and keep it 100% advertisement free. When you subscribe to the Minimalist Private Podcast on Patreon, you'll also receive a personal link so that our maximal episodes play in your favorite podcast app. You can find all the details and all the good stuff, including an additional private podcast episode every week over at theminimalists.com slash support. I know it's just a couple bucks but you get so much for those couple bucks. And we're uh, capping our Patreon community at 6,000 people because we want to keep it intimate. We are approaching that right now. And so if you want to get in, now is a good time to do that. No pressure. You don't have to do it immediately. But if you want to get in there, we're going to cap it at 6,000 patrons. Ryan, what else, what else you got for us this week? Here are some voicemail comments and tips from our listeners. Check them out. Hi, this is Leslie from New York. And I just listened to your most recent podcast about careers. And I've actually been re-listening to some of the older podcasts, and I listened to one of the original career ones as well. And something I just wanted to say for some of the listeners who are struggling with their jobs not lining up to their, you know, their values is that I, I'm a CPA, and I used to work in corporate finance and do a lot of uh, financial statement analysis and auditing for big corporations. And I was kind of getting, you know, disenfranchised and just not really loving what I was doing and, and what was the point. And what I do now is I still work as a CPA and I still do work as an auditor. But now I work for companies, um, I'm sorry, I should say I work for a firm that does a lot of work with not-for-profits. And so about 50% of my clients are not-for-profit organizations and it's, a good way to align my values with what I do for a living. I'm able to provide these not-for-profit associations with solutions to some of their financial issues, help them invest their money better, and also uh, help ensure the donors that their money is being used in the way that they would hope it would be. So just a way, you know, just something to, for people to think about that you don't necessarily have to completely jump ship on your career to find a way to make it align better with their values. Hey there, I'm Krista from Chicago, and this tip is for Gina from episode 202, who is having trouble with consumerism after downsizing her wardrobe. I also face this challenge, but I put a rule in place that has helped me make more deliberate and long-lasting purchases. When shopping, I make a list of the qualities the item must have for me to purchase it. For example, when I downsized, I realized I didn't have a good cold weather dress. But instead of just going out and buying one, I made a list of the qualities the dress needed to have so it could remain versatile and practical. It needed to be warm, cocktail length, and relatively minimal in design. That way I could wear it to many occasions and for many years without it looking out of place or out of style. When I went shopping for the dress, I stuck to those three qualities because if it didn't satisfy all three of those needs, I knew I would just end up looking for another one later. When I finally found the right one, I bought it, and I've worn it for the last six years without ever feeling the urge to shop for another. This rule really helps me identify why I need an item, and it can easily be applied not only to clothing, but to any potential purchase. All right, y'all, real quick for right here, right now, here's one thing that is going on in the life of the minimalists. It's the holidays, Ryan. Thanksgiving is this week, and um, that means, well, what does it mean? Holiday gift giving. <laughs> so make sure <laughs> you get all the appropriate gifts yeah we're actually going to talk a little bit on on patreon this week about about some holiday gift giving and don't worry we're going to do we'll do some gift giving stuff on the yeah. main podcast no, as gifts well. are great as long as they're as long as it's not an obligatory gift as, and as long as it's meaningful i mean i mean i hate because we are against like just you know getting tie clips for each other right um but we're announcing today the minimalist cufflinks. 
<laughs> now, if you are looking to gift a consumable, though, we uh, we own a coffee shop down in St. Petersburg, Florida. It used to be you could only buy the coffee that we roast between the four walls. It's called Bandit Coffee, by the way. You can follow it, uh, our coffee shop on, on Instagram. We'll put a link to the Instagram to Bandit in the show notes. We're offering food down there now, but you can also order our coffee. It's just at theminimalists.coffee is the website. We each month do The Minimalist Choice. It's what we're drinking currently, what we order personally. So if you're looking at gifting really good high-end coffee that Ryan and I really enjoy, well, theminimalists.coffee is your place. But as Ryan said, I wouldn't just give gifts out of obligation. You can do it anytime. You, you, you don't have to wait until December 25th to say, yeah, I got you something that I think is going to add value to your life. If you buy someone coffee who doesn't drink coffee, it's a very poor... You're a bad friend. Yes, <laughs> you are. <laughs> All right, if you have a question, comment, or minimalism tip for our podcast, leave us a voicemail, 406-219-7839, or send a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. You can comment on this episode at youtube.com slash theminimalists. If you want our show notes in your inbox, sign up for our email list over at theminimalists.com. Just enter your email address there at the top. You'll also receive our simple Sunday emails. And for our added value this week, Ryan, I was driving around Ohio all last week. Bex and I, we could not stop listening to the new Post Malone album. It's good, man. It is so good. It's my favorite album of his. Now, I've recommended his stuff before. I think it's total juvenilia. Uh, I mean, it's... But this album is... He is a musical chameleon. Yeah. Some of the songs on there are rap songs. Some mm. are 80s pop songs. And somehow they all sort of flow together seamlessly. Mm. On one track, he has Ozzy Osbourne and Travis Scott mm-hmm. on the same song. He's a good He's a good artist, man. So I want to close this out today with one of my favorite songs from that album. It's called Circles. And the album itself is called Hollywood's Bleeding. And if you leave here today with just one message, we hope it's this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. The Minimalists.